What is the difference between research and copying? This may seem an odd question. I think it's not a trivial question. It may serve as a litmus test for discovering whether one is or is not college ready. No one is college ready who cannot answer this question. So it's an important one. To understand the previous question, ask yourself the following question. And uh, I think some of you may be able to answer it, uh, and that's good. Uh, some of you may not, and uh, well, if not, let's uh, see if we can make some headway. Here's the question. How would someone write a history book? Would they just read prior books and copy them? But from where would those prior books come? Would they, as Mao Zedong might say, just to fall from heaven into our laps? How could anybody write that first book? Hmm. I often ask my undergraduate students, suppose you wanted to write a history of World War II, how would you do it? And the typical answer that I often get is, well, you read histories of World War II and you draw upon them. Maybe Winston Churchill's series, for example. But what about the first history of World War II? From what could it have been drawn? Uh, Churchill uh, said in response to a question, history will be very kind to me because I will write it. Uh, and indeed he did, uh, based on uh, his first hand experience with the highest level of command in World War II. He was able to draw not only on that primary source, uh, but also uh, had access to documents uh, commands, memos, all sorts of things. Eisenhower did essentially the same thing based on a similar experience. Again, uh, he was a primary source and drew upon further primary sources and uh, wrote uh, Crusade in Europe. Um, uh, his book and Churchill's books are among the first uh, secondary sources upon which scholars can then draw and still do draw. Now, Commander will understand something about a war. They will see the big picture. Uh, they will not see the war, for example. Patton sees it one way, and uh, Privates Willie and Joe in the foxholes in Third Army will see it another way. So it's a very complicated process to write about a war. I have friends who've been to war. I've not. I've never been in a combat zone, and I uh, hope to God never will. But they will say to me, you've not been there. You, you know, how can you talk about Vietnam? You've not been to Vietnam. Yes, uh, and that's true. And um, I will not understand their experience in Vietnam, for example, in the same way that they do. Um, on the other hand, um, when it comes to uh, the big picture, the soldier in Quezon may not see or have seen what that was. The commander in Saigon may not have seen, in fact, that's what problem, did not see uh, the realities on the ground. So if you spend time in Quezon, you understand that experience that you've had, you may not be any better than anyone else in understanding, for example, um, what it was like to confront cavalry at Agincourt or to stand with Leonidas and the 300 at Thermopylae or to fight with Socrates and the Athenian hoplites at uh, Amphipolis and so on and so forth. Um, so in a nutshell, this is what historians do. They draw on primary resources, build secondary resources, then draw from that body both the primary and secondary resources. That's pretty much the process in a nutshell. Uh, I know this is a very potted account, but, uh, but as nutshells go, I think that pretty much captures what happens. And not only in history, this is true of any other academic discipline as well, whether you're talking about philosophy, biology, whatnot. Scholars who, for example, write the books uh, that become the secondary literature, add to an ongoing body of literature that someone else has done before them and someone will continue after them. Now, it's important to understand that scholarship has this rationale. It's not simply ritual. It's not simply as it may look to people on the outside, just jumping through someone's hoop uh, like a trained dog. Scholars who write the books add to an ongoing body of literature. In order to do this, they must first read and understand what's come before them in this same body of literature, and they must also add something new to it. So how do they add something new? And the answer is one word, research. Research can comprise any number of things. Uh, it might be a matter of reading primary documents. It might be a matter of interviewing living subjects. It might be deriving data sets. It might be reinterpreting existing secondary literature and so forth. 
The point is there are different ways to do it, but you want to get some new stuff. Hmm? Now, an undergraduate will uh, do research and will uncover stuff that is new to you. Hmm? And advanced scholars doing research will, if they're lucky, uh, sometimes discover stuff that nobody else knew, no human mind has ever grasped before. Watson and Crick in 1953, first people ever to work out the structure of the DNA molecule, which now, of course, is, is a major, major, major part of our common knowledge, um, and a major discovery of the 20th century. Undergraduate students who are assigned either research term papers on the one hand or essays on the other are thereby being apprenticed to the basics of this very same process of research by which advanced scholars assimilate and add to the stock of human knowledge. Apprenticeship is the whole point of such assignments. And uh, there, here's a resource here. I give you the URL, um, the Harvard Guide for Students. When you write papers in college, you undergraduate students, your work is held to the same standards of citation as the work of your professors. Hold that thought. What's an apprentice? An apprentice is a novice who learns a craft by doing it alongside an experienced craftsman. For example, Here's a baker with, with an apprentice teaching the baker the ins and outs, the ropes, the apprentice, sorry, the ins and outs, the ropes of how to bake. Undergraduate study is also an apprenticeship, no less than baking. A large part of spending time in higher education is serving an apprenticeship in the craft of research. You do what you do because you're learning what we, your professors, do by doing the same thing. So we read existing secondary source literature. We explore new territory with primary sources. We analyze what we encounter. We synthesize this into knowledge. Alongside us, you learn to do the very same work. Incidentally, this is why we have such a bug about plagiarism. Hmm? Our community is a community based on research. Someone who just copies violates the most central norm of this community. And so any advanced scholar who would commit plagiarism, the hammer comes down. Any apprentice who violates the central norm will encounter the same wrath and for exactly the same reason. This is not a special imposition on students. It is because rather you are now considered members of our community that you are going to be held to the same standards to which we hold ourselves. Again, when you write papers in college, your work is held to the same standards of citation as the work of your professors. That's the point. For an undergraduate, the simplest version of learning the craft of research would be just to learn to do the initial literature review. So for example, uh, you're taking a broad survey course in modern European history. It might be quite sufficient to read through some of the key uh, secondary literature on Eisenhower's generals in World War II, for example, summarize that existing research, comment upon it. Mm -hmm. If you're a more advanced undergraduate, uh, let's say you might uh, try to tackle some major works on American military history over the course of the 20th century. And then in addition to the basic literature review, you might compose an essay based on it, discussing, for example, the effects of the Spanish-American War on military mobilization in both World War I and World War II. World War II, we finally got it right after a couple of false starts uh, previously, but that's an important story and you know, one well worth uh, thinking about, one well worth uh, studying and researching. Or let's take another field in history, uh, philosophy. Uh, an undergraduate philosophy student might be set an essay exam topic on the classical problem known as rationalism versus empiricism. First, it would be necessary to summarize readings from the major figures then to comment on the way the problems changed over time and in what state we now find the problem. Such an undergraduate student may not be doing novel research, um, may not even be tackling primary source documents. This is one of the things that marks the boundary between undergraduate and graduate research, but almost certainly it will not also be advancing the state of the research field in question, but he or she will be engaged in research standing on what are essentially the bottom rungs of the same ladder as advanced scholars performing their research. So it's the same ladder, just different rungs. In short then, undergraduate papers and essays are apprenticeships in the same craft of research that ultimately produces the body of knowledge, whatever field you're talking about, which is now being transmitted to these students through their formal coursework. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't just fall from heaven. It takes some labor. And a major point of doing this apprenticeship is to grasp this fact. Hmm? Does it fall from heaven? It doesn't happen magically. It takes some work. So 
here's how not to do a research paper or an essay. The Google copy and paste method. So you're assigned the topic of rationalism and empiricism. You go Google rationalism and empiricism. Hey, you turn up the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy article on that subject. By the way, it's a very good source. Stanford Encyclopedia is, is, is a good general source for, for philosophy students. So you caught one. Okay. Well, then sometimes what people do is they hit control C and then they hit control V, copy and paste. And so here is a hypothetical student named Dunning Kruger, who's done just that for his intro philosophy course. What do you mean all my facts are wrong? I copied everything straight off the internet. Hmm. It seems maybe silly, but simple and copy, paste, copy and paste is very common. How many students do exactly this? Now, there are several problems. The most obvious problem with this is academic dishonesty. Hmm? Uh, this essay gets a zero for plagiarism. That's a zero for the entire assignment, at the very least, if not for the entire course. Plagiarism is any attempt to use someone else's authorship as if it was one's own. Here's the most simultaneously accurate and concise definition of plagiarism I've found. It comes from Harvard University's study guide. Uh, all Harvard students are required to read this uh, before they begin. Um, I think it's not a bad idea for non-Harvard students as well. Plagiarism is, and I quote, the act of either intentionally or unintentionally submitting work that was written by someone else. Now, is plagiarism a problem? Yes, it is. But plagiarism is not the only problem. Even if there's not outright plagiarism, even if the material was closely paraphrased but not copied outright, or the material was copied outright but quoted and attributed, the little cut and copy and paste approach um, just misses the whole point of academic research about as badly as it is possible to miss it. Um, in the Google copy and paste approach, there is at best minimal labor. There's no attempt at intellectual synthesis, second, and therefore third, there is no education. A researcher is not simply a scribe copying from another source. A researcher is not simply an editor collecting even with attribution from a variety of sources. A researcher is rather an author, someone who writes original work. Now, this original work may draw upon prior literature. It need not be entirely unique in the case of research work. It shouldn't be. And even creative literary fiction will draw upon traditions and make allusions to prior authors. But the difference is here, the guy on the left is an author. He's writing his own stuff. He may have done some research first, but it's his that's put together. The guy on the right in the bandit mask, he's a thief. He's a parasite, not an author. Uh, he's simply siphoning off the other guy's labors. And some of the several problems uh, in doing this are, you know, be careful from whom one copies. Uh, what, if you, uh, what if you copy from a liar, a cheat, or an idiot? Um, Susie, what's the answer to question two? Eli, what in the cotton gin? This is a philosophy problem. It's a trick question. How come you wrote something different? Well, I'm going to get this question wrong so it won't look like you copied. Wow, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's for authorship. What about editing? Is it legitimate? Yes, it is. When it's done by advanced scholars. However, it's never a legitimate approach editing to an undergraduate assignment such as a term paper. Here are two books. Uh, one is an edited anthology. One is a, an original work. Uh, they're both very useful. I use the Poyman uh, anthology in uh, my intro philosophy class. Uh, it's a very good one. Um, and they know what they're doing. They know how to select and how to edit. The one on the right by Karl Popper, uh, an original work in the philosophy of science. He is the author, not the editor. It's no less original, though, for the fact that he draws upon prior philosophy. He does. He simply doesn't reproduce. Doesn't simply reproduce. Back to term papers and essays. A mere string of quotations, sometimes called the mosaic, sometimes called mosaic plagiarism, is not an original work. This is so, regardless of whether the string is illegitimate or legitimate, whether it's plagiarized quotations or footnoted quotations, an edited work is not an original work. Now, it could be, again, useful for advanced scholars to publish edited works, but the ability to speak authoritatively as an editor has to be earned. It's not a given. In any event, once again, under no circumstances is an edited work acceptable as an undergraduate research paper or essay. So go back to Mr. Dunning-Kruger. Uh, the example on the right clearly plagiarized. What if he 
was up front and said, uh, Dunning Kruger is not the author of this, but the editor and put all the material in quotation marks. Well, it's a little better uh, by virtue of not being uh, overtly dishonest, but in either case, what these two methods have in common, the editorship rather than the authorship, um, is, is never acceptable in, in an undergraduate research paper or essay. I mentioned Google. Google is not the problem. Missing the point is the problem. Hmm? Uh, Arthur Conan Doyle has a Sherlock Holmes tale called the Redheaded League in which, for reasons we won't go into in the story, uh, a bunch of guys uh, are, are paid to copy out by hand the Encyclopedia Britannica. Well, this is way pre-Google. So don't blame Google, don't blame the internet, don't even blame control C. Hmm? In olden days, students used to copy by hand for the Encyclopedia Britannica in the way that they now copy and paste for Wikipedia. But even though copying texts is a very old tradition, you know, scribes go back to ancient times, you as students are not just scribes. Hmm? And copying is not research. If this comes as news, well, better late than never, Blame high schools, perhaps, from which many of you uh, will have emerged without having acquired any imagination or knowledge about, and, and, and once it arises, about knowledge and once it arises, what I mean to say. And whose English programs have not taught you how to do research papers. They should. Uh, some of them used to. Many of them no longer do. Or blame colleges, too. Uh, there was a time when all freshmen took the exact same courses in lockstep. Now, this went away in the 60s, and I think on the whole, personally speaking, the reforms of the 60s were all mostly to the good. But one of the downsides is, uh, although students had less latitude, um, they were also more likely to come across a common set of uh, standards and to be prepared, uh, including the, for the writing of research papers. Be that as it may, one should be clear. Morally speaking, plagiarism is always an offense. There is no excuse. At the same time, there may be different motives for and different degrees of offense. It's clearly wrong to form the intention to get over by stealing, but it is conceivable that some plagiarism results from lack of imagination about what research is. That such lack of imagination in turn is the result, a result of faulty instruction or possibly just a sheer lack of instruction. Perhaps high school, perhaps also colleges have let you down, but if so, who's going to let you up? if not yourselves. College readiness, that's important. Even if 12th grade did not give you all the necessary tools, well, you're not in 13th grade and 14th grade now, nothing's gonna change in that respect, so get yourself up to speed. And again, I mentioned the Harvard sources, uh, all incoming students at Harvard are required to read the guide. Probably a good idea for everybody else too. So I hope if um, you were not able to answer the question from the outset, what's the difference between research and copying that, uh, that now, you may be in a better position to do so. And my best advice uh, upon that would be go enjoy some research.